Welcome to Spirit in Action. My name is Mark Helpsmeet, and each week we bring you visits and conversations with people doing healing work for this world, hearing what they're doing and what inspires them and supports them in doing it. Welcome to Spirit in Action. Believe it or not, folks, but I am definitely not seeking guest stories and issues related to the current coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, but they have simply come to my door, or rather, my phone. I've known today's Spirit in Action guest, Michael Lewick Troms, for more than 30 years and helped arrange for his Busseum tour to make a stop here in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, some 15 years ago. Michael's Ph.D. is in European history, and he is the founder and director of the Traces Center for History and Culture. Recently, Michael emailed and called me about the upcoming Basim display and tour called Hidden or Forbidden No More, Prequels to the Greatest Generation, to talk about a particular element of the display, the killer 1918's flu pandemic with a raft of lessons for today from what the USA and the world experienced back in 1918. Dr. Michael Lewick Troms joins us today via Zoom from Germany. Michael, it's so good to be with you again today, this time for Spirit in Action. It's my pleasure too, Mark. Of course, I say to be with you, although you're in Germany. Whereabouts exactly? Actually, I'm sitting in Erfurt, Germany, in almost the geographical center of this country. And how long have you been hanging out there? (laughs) Well, this time I've been here since early March. I got stranded. We can talk about that in a moment if you want. But I've been here on and off since the 1990s when I did my doctoral research in Berlin at Humboldt University. Which is how you became a your doctorate in European history. That's right. Yet, interestingly, when I've encountered you, it's mainly been about American history. Do you have to come back to the U.S. to learn that? <laughs> no, not at all. It fits really well because all of my, quote, American historical projects all have a German connection. I think the one that you're thinking of the most, Mark, would be the Scattergood Hostel story about 185 refugees in Nazi Europe who fled and found a safe haven first at a Quaker hostel near Iowa City and then throughout the Midwest. So they all have German connections, even though they're, quote, American-based stories. And your last name, Louis Trams, that is German. What's your heritage? My um, ancestors were half German, the other half British, Dutch, Danish. I'm a white mongrel. The German part, it would be the Trams. They're from Pomerania, which is now northeast of Berlin. And Louis is from uh, Stuttgart in Schwaben. All of this interest in history led you to go to university there in Humboldt University in Berlin. Did you start interested in history? What's this genesis of, and, and why history? Why do you even care about it? I mean, a lot of people today seem to ignore it completely, and we're going to be talking a lot about it today. Well, I'm actually a closet anthropologist. In fact, my first undergrad declared major was anthropology, and I loved it learning about family structures, for example, matriarchies as opposed to patriarchies, dance, music, religion, culinary culture. I was going to town until they told me, oh, now this part of your studies, you had to dig up old bones. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I switched to history. But actually, as long as I've been a historian, I've always been interested in sort of the anthropological aspects of history. What have people through time done for work? What have they done in their leisure time for off-work activities? What have people eaten? What have they listened to for music? How have they addressed themselves? So I've always been interested in the social, historical aspects of the human experience. And what good does that do for the world? It does a lot of good. The world is actually run by ideas more than things. For example, money is not really a thing. Yes, we have pieces of paper or plastic cards or little metal round things we drop in slots for candy bars. But money is just an agreed value on something. Same thing with religion. I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to go out and and find Jesus or Buddha or or Muhammad somewhere today and touch those historical figures. But people, of course, run their lives according to what is said to be their precepts. So the world's actually run along the lines of ideas more than actual things. And social history is how we organize our understanding of ideas over time. 
I've had as one of my guests over the years, a couple times actually, is James Lowen, uh, lies my teacher told me. And I've had a couple other noted historians because I do think that if we don't learn the lessons of the past, we'll continue to repeat them. Today, we specifically want to talk about a mistake that's being repeated, something we didn't learn from in the past and how it's going to be corrected. And I understand this is one of five topics that are going to be part of your upcoming bus seum, like in a museum with a bus, yes. tour, which was supposed to have started in March. So first of all, a lot of the folks listening have no idea what a bus seum is. Could you explain this? Certainly. So I actually have the great honor and the privilege to direct two educational nonprofit organizations. One is called TRACES, Center for History and Culture, based in Iowa, my native home. And the other is called SPUREN, which is TRACES in German, located here in Erfurt, Germany. Both of them look at German and American connections. And we have, in the United States, a great teaching tool called the Basium. To be frank, we're on our third bus. We keep wearing through our buses. These are retrofitted school buses that we shell out. We remove all the seats and we do other funky things. And uh, with the last two of the three buses, we've actually had the museum up front with, I think in this case, it's between 15 and 20 uh, display panels where we tell a story in narrative form with accompanying photographs or maps or other images. And we have three or four vitrines, which are the glass cases museums use to display artifacts or props from the period. In both the second and now this third bus, people go about mid-section into a thing called the mini auditorium. The back half of the bus is actually a place we can seat a class at a time. We can put 25 or so you know, school kids and their teachers in the back. And there we have shown many films. We've had guest speakers. We've had public discussions. Often when we're showing the busseum, the hosts, who tend to be libraries or museums, colleges, civic groups, They'll often have a special program within the showing of the bus about one of the topics being told. I should uh, emphasize that at the current exhibit called Hidden or Forbidden No More, Prequels to the Greatest Generation, we have five subtopics. If I may just briefly, the first one is called Kicking the Kaiser, Anti-German Hysteria in World War I. Of course, this is a perfect topic for especially Wisconsin, but all the Midwest states, which were heavily settled by German Americans. A second topic is, of course, sadly, very timely, the killer 1918 flu pandemic, where we dissect the actual evolution of the flu great disaster of 100 years ago. You and I will be talking about this, but there are many takeaways, the first one being its very name. We erroneously call it the Spanish flu. It was not Spanish in any way, shape, or form. It should have been called, if anything, the Kansan flu, but we'll get back to that. Third topic is whiskey cookers, Midwest bootleggers during the Great Depression. Fourth topic is called America's White Cancer, the 1920 second wave of the Ku Klux Klan. There were millions of Klan members in the United States in the 1920s, many of them in the Midwest, in Iowa and Wisconsin, up into Canada. And those outside the South weren't particularly anti-Black. They were rapidly anti-Catholic, which we can talk about maybe in another interview. The um, fourth top, fifth topic, sorry, is called the Cow Wars. And these are the stories of farmer rebellions, also in Wisconsin, Farmers in the Great Depression who took cues from other groups, Michigan auto workers, Minnesota truckers, U.S. veterans from World War I who went on strike and demanded relief during the Great Depression. And unfortunately, that topic is also very timely because now over 10% of Americans are unemployed and we risk having social unrest on a massive scale, similar to that in the Great Depression. But again, those are outside of our topics, which today is the flu pandemic 1918 and some of its takeaways for the current crisis. So we're going to get talking about the pandemics in just a moment. A few more words about the Busseum Tour. Originally, it was supposed to start this year in March. Something happened, which is almost ironic considering your second topic for the Busseum Tour was the killer, the pandemic. So how did that hit you? To be honest, two things happened. I got ill. I had reason to fear that I might have colon cancer. And it actually turned out to be one quarter of the cost of flying from Kansas City to Frankfurt, taking the train to Erfurt. I spent six days in the hospital, and it cost a quarter of what it would cost in Mason City, Iowa, to do the same colonoscopy and other procedures in the hospital there. That's one of the problems with the corona pandemic now, 
is the American health system was not built to serve the public. It was built to make money. And so now you've got all these people getting sick. Well, I was afraid that I was ill, came back to Air Force, was hospitalized. And then right when I was released, President Trump basically closed our airspace to all European flights and I got stranded. So I am still in Germany. But, you know, to be honest, it's a good place to be stranded. I want to point out that Germany has had, I think, less than half the number of confirmed corona infections the United States has had, but the death rate, the mortality rate, is also less than half, even adjusted for the comparable numbers. So at some point, if we get to talking about health systems, why is it that the Germans are doubly successful at keeping people from dying? I'll give you the clue, our health system. <laughs> Anyway, that's how I got stranded here. The bus is still in Kansas City. It's waiting for me to return. And we had our initial gigs set up for Missouri, Iowa, and into other states. And then, of course, everyone had to bail. So our bus is waiting. The man who's our patron says, don't worry, it's quarantine, so our bus will be fine. But whenever I do get back to the United States, we're hoping that's by June or so, we want to take the bus out. We're currently working with interested parties in the Midwest to find host. We have to start from scratch. Our previous plan got shredded. A footnote, by the way, the bus will be a great educational tool for when we are back, because if people are afraid to go into churches or schools or museums in case they might be infectious, our bus always has open windows and doors. There's always air circulating, and it has no fabric surfaces like an auditorium does on the seats. We can wash and disinfect and wipe down our bus all the time. And so our bus is really ideal for this current crisis and one of the five stories is told outside, and people can actually watch videos. They don't have to go in the bus. So when we do get back on the road, the bus seem is a perfect corona. I, I'd be aligned if I said corona proof, but it's certainly corona resistant way of sustaining culture, even in a time of plague. Human society has to have cultural activities. People have to think about something besides, am I going to get sick? I'm going to get die. This is important that we find a way to shoulder on. And we bring these stories to the public. I think it's probably important for people to know where they can update on this information. Traces.org is the place to look, right? Yes. If you go to www.traces, like the outline of something, T-R-A-C-E-S.org, you can get a lot of information. We still have to update our schedule because there is the old schedule. And if they are really wanting up-to-date information, you can contact Christine at staff at traces.org. That's S-T-A-F-F at traces.org. So we'll have that link, of course, on northernspiritradio.org. Of course, people will be listening to this across the United States and via our website and all of the different places that our programs are carried. But do you have some thinking now? Is there anticipated time when the tour will happen? Since you're working with open windows in the bus, let's just assume it's not December. Uh, actually, I plan to be back on the road as soon as possible. I'm hoping that will be July, perhaps June, but certainly by August, September, I need to be somewhere. One of the reasons we want to have this story now is because of the election of, of November 3rd. And in fact, the bus tour will conclude, I think it's the day before the election. We want to be there because we can't bring up current issues in our bus for a couple of reasons. We're nonpartisan. We do get public money, so we can't take official public stances on current issues. But like any good set of historians, we're holding up a distant mirror. Well, for God's sakes, out of the five topics, two of them are directly relevant to the current moment, the flu pandemic of 1918 with its various takeaways, but also the cow wars. Again, as I just alluded, if 10% of the country continues to be jobless and people have a hard time putting food on the table – there will be a crisis, not just a health crisis, but a social crisis. And this is what happened in the 1930s, where a quarter of all Americans were jobless. And in many towns like Pittsburgh and Gary, a third of all American workers were, were without a job. So we have several of our five sub-stories that are very relevant to this moment. It was a coincidence. Well, also, I would argue that the topic about the KKK, what you call the Klan, America's White Cancer, it's not necessarily officially the Ku Klux Klan that's arising right now, but the white nationalist movements have gained considerable energy over the last few years. So that would seem to be perfectly relevant as well. Actually, all five topics have a lot to say about today. The other thing that's important to note is these five topics actually dovetail, just briefly, the rapid anti-German hate of World War I is visible again in the Prohibition era 
because those who are pushing prohibition in large part want to hit those so-called crowds on the head. All of the German breweries of the Midwest were in German hands. And the Anglos, the Anglicans, some of the Methodists, Presbyterians, they were appalled that these Germans were going to the beer garden on Sunday. German Catholics had no prohibition about, you know, drinking lots of red wine. And so prohibition was in large part an anti-German ploy. And then when the Klan arose in the 20s, they hated those who were, quote, brewing hooch or, you know, bootleg. And they also didn't like Catholics, and they didn't like German Catholics. And when you go to our website and look at the story of Templeton Rye in Templeton, Iowa, that was a German Catholic town through the 20s and 30s, bootlegging. And the Klan came from Carroll and other places in Iowa and burned their crosses and tried to shut them down. So all these stories, unfortunately, very neatly dovetail one into the other. And I find connection with that. My wife actually grew up in Iowa, the Amana colonies, which you can't get more German. I mean, before she was there, her father grew up. The schools all taught in German. It was, I mean, they lived communally there. And I grew up Catholic. Of course, that wasn't till I was born in 1954. So anti-Catholic or this Catholic and Protestant divide, which was part of the KKK steam, I saw those reverberations while I was growing up in the 60s. So, yes, there's so many different connections that the Basium Tour brings that are relevant to today. If I can, I mean, this is relevant to Wisconsin audience members, is that the oldest kindergarten was founded in 1885 in Watertown, Wisconsin, by Margareta Schwartz, the wife of Carl Schwartz, the so-called 48er. When we were talking earlier about my mother's maiden name, Trams, and I use both my father's and mother's pre-married names, um, the Tramses came to Watertown in the 1800s, and they lived there. But the kindergarten in Watertown operated in German till 1918 or 1917 or 1919, and then it too closed under pressure. Same in Herman, Missouri, which is a very German town. All across the Midwest, these German schools ceased functioning in German. German was forbidden uh, by the Indiana universities. The school curriculum dropped German from schools in Iowa. There were public book burnings. We have photos in our exhibit from Baraboo, Wisconsin, with big piles of ashes in the county courthouse square. We have pictures from Osage, Iowa, near where my grandma was born, of book burning. They burned books in Algona and in Davenport. These are things we don't think about, which brings us to all these five topics. We've purposely chosen mostly obscure stories that have been hidden or forbidden for decades. I mean, we grew up in a very prosperous post-war America. I never knew about the KKK being outside the South. I didn't know about it being in Iowa in the 20s. And I didn't know my father's grandfather was in the Klan in the 20s. I was named after great-grandpa George Michael Lewick. So all of these things are our cultural legacy, but these legacies have been mostly tabooized. They're verpönt in German, they're poopooed. You're not supposed to talk about them. That's exactly why we have to talk about them, because we're not supposed to. And if we do talk about them, I mean, you've been doing this historical education via the Busseum and other means. You've been doing this for years. Have you seen change happen? Yes. What is a sad thing is that I only see people mostly in the bus, but I see people having great conversations. By coincidence, during the Abu Ghraib period of the Gulf War, sorry, the Iraq War, not the Gulf War. I heard people having discussions, oh, well, this is how we treated German POWs in World War II in America. How does that compare with how we treat POWs today? I mean, I literally heard people posing difficult questions and pondering the answers. Now, the sad part is, at some point, they all leave our bus and they go away. What is nice is once in a while, I'm passing through a town or I'm in a restaurant and someone says, aren't you the guy with the bus? I say, yes, that's me. Hey, I saw your exhibit and I want you to know and, and, I, and I hear that people really, they go home and talk about these topics with their loved ones. They write papers about them at school. I mean, that's the great thrill, but I only see a, f- a fraction of our, our bus visitors. But indeed, I know that there is a long wake behind our bus. Again, folks, when you want to find out about the Busseum, where you want to go is traces.org, T-R-A-C-E-S, traces.org. You can find the link on nordenspiritradio.org. Michael Lewick Troms is here today for Spirit in Action. We're talking about not just overall the Busseum tour that will be upcoming, but we're going to talk about one element of particular, which he calls the killer 1918's flu epidemic. 
We'll talk about that in just a moment, but first remember you are listening to Spirit in Action, which is a Northern Spirit Radio production. On the web, you find us at northernspiritradio.org. Come to that site and you'll find links to traces. You'll find links to all of our guests. It's almost 15 years now we've been doing this program and we've had a wealth of people who are uplifting movement to heal the world. And certainly that's what Michael and Traces are about. You'll find links there. You'll find an opportunity to rate and to comment on these programs. We love having your feedback. Two-way communication is the best. Also, there's a donate button. That's how this full-time work is supported. Click on donate to help us out. Even more so, I really, really, really strongly suggest that you support your local community radio station. Local media is so absolutely vital to get out a different voice, as you'll find as we're talking with Michael today about the work of Trace's organization. So often there is a narrative that is governed by several large media outlets. And right now in the U.S., over 90% of our media is owned by just six corporations. So it is so absolutely vital that you hear those alternative voices and where you're going to find them is on local community radio, local media. So please support them. It's absolutely vital to a better future for our world. So again, Michael Lewick Troms is here. We're talking about the Busseum Tour. There's five components to it. The Busseum Tour is literally a bus that will be traveling around. And when you go to traces.org, you'll find where they will be traveling once travel is reinstated. Point number two is called the Killer 1918's flu pandemic. You already explained, Michael, that it is mistakenly called the Spanish flu. That's what everybody knows it as. You said it should be called the Kansan flu. Explain that history, please. There are pictures on our narrated PowerPoint program accessible through our website or at our YouTube channel. There are pictures of Camp Funston in Kansas, which was a support camp for Fort Riley, a cavalry camp in Kansas. There was a big dust storm over a weekend in early March 1918, and that prairie dust storm blew up all this atomized animal dung that had been burned in the camp furnaces with other garbage. And they figure that somewhere the flu virus jumped from donkeys, uh, mules, horses, swine, some animal, and it jumped to the human population. Because early Monday morning, one of the soldiers came to the camp commissary of course, it was, it was a cook, and he complained of a sore throat and not feeling well. And by noon, there were 100 men, and by the week's end, there were 500. And about 10% of these men died, and they had really horrible symptoms, horrible coughing, and their lungs would fill with fluids, and many of them literally drowned it in their own rib cages. So this flu broke out in the spring of 1918, and here's one of the first takeaways for the current day. The military doctors pleaded with the military and with the government officials, do not send these soldiers out. Of course, that's what they did. In fact, you can trace the shipment of soldiers. When I heard it was from Chicago to the southeast to a different camp, but I've heard of other lines, that everywhere where the train would stop and people would throng the trains and hand their doughboys to be bottles of hooch or, you know, cake or a sausage or bread or whatever for the trip and sh- shake their hands or excited. People began to break out with the flu. You can trace the contagion route along these railroad lines. At any rate, the government did send soldiers from Fort Riley to Fort Snelling in St. Paul. So Fort Snelling soon became a center of the flu. Soldiers sent elsewhere. Above all, they were sent to Europe. It was in Europe that the flu that the Americans brought with them jumped across the no man's land to the Eastern Front. The Germans soon also had the flu. The Brits had the flu. The French had the flu. And it began to be called the Spanish flu, the Spanish Cronkite, because Spain was the only country in Europe that was somehow not involved with the war, and therefore they didn't have censorship of the press. The press openly talked about the flu pandemic in Spain during that period, so the French called it the Spanish flu, as did the Germans and the Americans, whereas the Spanish called it the French flu. So everybody was happy to give somebody else the blame. Ever heard of the Chinese flu the last couple of days? At any rate... The flu virus mutated. They figure, the epidemiologists, of which I don't belong to, I'm, I'm a historian, I'm an epidemiologist, they are probably supply ships from Brest in Brittany, northwest France, took the virus to maybe Senegal or the 
uh, western coast of tropical Africa. At any rate, the virus then went back to Europe and it mutated. And as of September of 1918, this mutated version was the so-called second wave. This is one of the things that we need to take to heart now, exactly now, because the first wave of the flu in March of 1918 was tame and relatively harmless compared to the September 1918 wave. When these boys and these ships going back from the war got off in Boston and in New York and Philadelphia and other places, they took the flu with them. And soon Camp Devons was devastated. Again, you can go to our website, www.traces.org, and click on historical case studies toward the bottom of the homepage. And you can view these films. They're illustrated with even sound effects. So soon there were dozens, and then hundreds, and thousands of soldiers at Camp Devons. Philadelphia was a particularly sad case because exactly there, the government wanted to have, I think it was the third, maybe the fourth war bonds rally. And the city fathers and mothers, if there were any, were going to have hundreds of thousands of Philadelphians come downtown on the given day. The medical community said, don't do that, don't do that. They did it. And they had Hundreds of thousands of people down by the city hall, the statue of William Penn, the Quaker founder of the colony, up above looking down. If he had only known what was about to happen, three days later, Philadelphia was paralyzed by dozens, hundreds of thousands of people sick and thousands of deaths. Philadelphia had the highest mortality rate because, again, you had this cross wires of goals. You had this perfect storm where the government officials and the military wanted to speed things up and bring soldiers together and war bond purchasers together. And they wanted to bring recruits and nurses together and send them very quickly around the world. Medical people said, no, keep people apart. They didn't say social distancing as such. Keep people apart and slow things down. Who won? The White House and the military. Who lost? About 725,000 Americans died of that flu. Yeah, certainly. So many people died. I saw, by your information, a number reported differently than I'd heard before. I'd heard that 20 million people died worldwide because of that 1918 flu. And I saw you reported 50 million, and uh, that seems a very large discrepancy. Who's got the fake news? Well, I wouldn't know if it's fake. I mean, this is an art, not a science. They say up to 50 million died. It's difficult to know. The number of, uh, is it 725,000 Americans dying in that pandemic seems pretty accurate. It's difficult to know. For example, we think that there are over a million Russians who died, but they were in the middle of a civil war with the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. How do you count that? But scientists, medical historians have tried to get a grip on it. They think it's up to 50 million. I'd say it was at least 20 million. If you go to part one of our two-part series, Part one is about the virus. Part two is the victims of the virus of 1918. The last half or third of that part one is only about the flu going to Canada. Those native communities up in Labrador and toward Alaska, 90% of the people died. Not only were they getting white people's germs again, but it was this flu virus strain. The million Mexicans are said to have died in that wave. The present reelect of Brazil died you know, 600,000 Brazilians. So the numbers are there. And then we cross the South Atlantic, go to South Africa, how many hundreds of thousands of South Africans died. We go to India, we look at China, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Russia. And then at the end of that part one, we go all through the major European powers, Britain, France, Germany, Spain. And we look at every country, you know, 600,000 Germans died, 250,000 Brits died, 300,000 French died. I think it was 250 or 300,000 Spaniards died. I think it was a million people in Iran. Again, Iran's being hit this time too. So it's difficult to put the numbers together, but I can clearly imagine it's up to 50 million. Certainly 20 million is conservative. It surprises me how quickly that flu and other diseases moved in the world before you had airplanes. And I mean, right now, any of us can travel in a couple of days across the country by car. I don't think that was so easy to in 1918. Uh, The car was still a pretty new invention at that time. How did it spread so quickly? Is there a different thing about the way that people lived? And and this would seem relevant to today's world because since we do travel so quickly and so often, I mean, I think back in the days, you're out on the farm, you travel into town once in a week, right? You weren't in every day. Not to scold you, Mark, but to scold most contemporaries. So we have the image of how hyper-modern we all are. 
But actually, we're not that different from our predecessors. Certainly, a lot of people traveled in the early part of the 20th century. We don't think about all those immigrant ships coming, bringing those immigrants to the United States. The ships didn't go back empty. There were tourists, there were merchants, there were sailors, there were soldiers being shipped around, plus it was a time of war. But even in the time of peace in that era, I mean, America had the most mileage of tracks in the world. We no longer do, but we had at that point, we had zillions of tracks. Every little county seat on the prairie had then a live railroad track and a station with frequent shipments of people and goods and mail that all went by land. Literally, the mail crossed the country by land. There was, there was no air post yet. But also the supply routes, the British, the French, and Spanish, Portuguese colonists had built extensive railroad lines across India, South America. They needed to, to tap, I resisted saying the word steel, but it came to mind, to tap rubber, bauxite, bananas, wood. I mean, there was stuff moving all the time. And if railroad workers, in fact, that's how the flu got so quickly to the mining camps of South Africa, because the rail lines from the ocean directly to the gold mines, soon the big outbursts, the big outbursts weren't in Cape Town. They were in the country near, near Johannesburg in the middle of the, of the land. I do understand that there's quick transportation. I just figured that we do it every day. It's like we drive into town every week. Whereas when I was living with my aunt and uncle, when I was nine years old, we went shopping in town once a week. You know, it's that kind of difference that I was thinking that it would only accelerate things the way that we live now with our rapid transportation. There's one more aspect of this to remember, uh, talking about, again, social history we tend to live alone or in small groups these days. How many people in America and Europe are living alone, okay? But in 1918, a great many people, especially outside of cities, were multi-generational with the grandparents, maybe even an odd uh, great-grandparent who was still on the scene, children, in-laws. It wasn't uncommon for several couples in one family to live under one roof. Plus you had the higher density of, of the cities generally, poor neighborhoods especially, particularly in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, even New Orleans, or parts of then San Francisco. I mean, the density of residency was much higher then. And plus, each house typically had more people in it than today. And so if you have that sort of density of population, that's what the New Yorkers are finding now under this coronavirus pandemic, is unfortunate geography of being so densely populated. And that was more the norm in urban America in those days. The suburbs had not yet been unleashed we didn't have the GI Bill. We didn't have the interstate highway system yet. That all came later. People lived in cities, and cities were compact. Folks, we are speaking with Michael Lewick Troms today. His doctorate is in European history. He's founder, curator, and chief bottle washer for an organization called Traces, Center for History and Culture, based out of Iowa, though we're speaking to him today. Well, he's over in Germany. One of the reasons that we're speaking to Michael today is because we're trying to look at our situation today with the illness related to the virus, which originated in Wuhan province of China, from what we best understand. And we're comparing that with the lessons learned in 1918. There is uh, what's normally called the Spanish flu that actually originated from Kansas, not from Spain. I find it ironic, by the way, Michael, that the reason that it got called the Spanish flu is because that was the one country that wasn't suppressing the news. I understand that in China, that the government there first tried to suppress knowledge of the virus going around. That didn't stop it from getting connected with its point of origin. But how parallel are the situations, the suppression of the news about the virus in the U.S. or in in Europe versus what the suppression that the Chinese were attempting to do just within the last six months? One of the reasons that the um, other belligerent powers in World War I were not talking so freely at first about the pandemic is they didn't want to, quote, demoralize the people on the home front. That's why they talked about the flu being a Spanish phenomena. 
There are parallels, of course, to the current day with Russia being so slow to admit it had a more serious problem than it let on. China probably has had more cases than it officially talks about. Other regimes like in Iran or Turkey have hush-hushed their real situation. But now, you know what is hitting the fan? The baby doo-doo is being blown all over. They can't deny it anymore because people know that their doctors are pleading on social media for us to send extra masks and disinfectants. They can't hide it anymore. And one other thing I want to talk about briefly, another takeaway from 1918, is the African National Congress in South Africa and the Indian National Congress and what became India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, and Bhutan. Those nationalist movements had a great jumpstart through this flu pandemic because the British colonial power holders basically retreated into their compounds and boarded up the gates and waited to sit the thing out. It was only other activists, Africans and Indians, who actually took food and drink and, and blankets to those suffering. And after this was all over, they became the heroes. And so the African National Congress, the Indian National Congress got great social capital. If you look for corollaries, the regimes in Turkey or in India have done miserable jobs of preparing their populace. Just what, two examples. In Turkey, a couple of days ago, when they announced the shutdown, they gave people two hours notice. And in India, it was four hours notice. Imagine if your government tells you, oh, as of two hours, you cannot go out, you must stay at home, or in, in uh, India's case, four hours. It set off pandemonium and panic buying and chaos and it put all those people, that's another takeaway from 1918. So often the government and the military and the medical personnel were doing their best. They thought it was a germ, a bacteria. Well, it, it was a virus in 1918 that they didn't even know to look for because they didn't understand viruses. So here they were looking for a bacteria under the microscopes when it was a virus that their microscopes in 1918 were not strong enough to even detect. So they couldn't even see what they didn't know they didn't know. So there were classic examples from 1918, 1919, that flu pandemic with today. You have people making the wrong decisions. I just alluded to Turkey, where they gave the population literally two hours of warning. As of midnight tonight, you can't go out and shop. Same thing with India, four hours. But France, the country that we think would be so advanced, after all, they did great work in the AIDS, HIV pandemic of, of the 80s, early 90s. The French totally screwed up. This is just a couple of days ago when they announced you cannot go outside your apartment from 10 in the morning till six at night. You have to do your jogging and sport in the parks before 10 or after six. The idea was to keep people off the streets from 10 to six, but they caused the opposite. So now you, you can Google it and see video clips of the streets full in France, full of joggers and bikers and skaters and skateboarders. The government actually is creating the nightmare they wanted to avoid, and that is putting people, large numbers of people, close together. It happened in India with all those migrant workers trying within four hours to, go, to start their way home. Most of them had to walk because the trains were shut down. You saw that in Turkey. You can Google it. The shops were full of people, shoulder to shoulder. It's exactly the opposite. You don't want people to come and to cough and hack on each other. You want to keep them apart. So you've got governments who are actually being the handmaiden to the virus, that the governments are actually making policies and, and taking actions that are counterproductive. It's absolutely absurd. They keep doing it. Is there something we should have learned from 1918 about the shelter in place? Because I understand that they did do that. They issued those kind of orders to keep people apart. I know that in Wisconsin they did. I've seen the news articles from 1918. So is there something we should have learned about how they did it in 1918 that should have been applied in 2020? They certainly had quarantine. Telephones were relatively widespread in towns. Some people even had them out in the countryside. Most of the countryside did not, did not have electricity. No one had a radio. Everyone still depended on newspapers. So they had quarantine, but it was hard to stay in contact. You were really shut up in your own home with your family and nearby some neighbors. And whoever could get a newspaper to see the latest announcements from the mayor's office. Today, with social media, we all can go home and yet stay in closer contact. At least it feels closer contact. One of the things we did not learn from 1918 was to always be vigilant and prepare. 
And this is where we've we've fallen down. And I know that we can't be partisan as such, plus not want to be. It's kind of productive. But with the current administration, we knew since January or actually late December, the Chinese were having a problem. And it doesn't matter which part of the world we're talking about. It has to be China. It could be Africa. It could be India. It could be Iowa. But any problematic area on the planet where similar things keep happening, like Ebola in Africa, but in China with SARS and with swine flu and other avian flus, we know that China is a very tightly packed country. We know that those are often ancient cities. We know that people often live multi generations in a in a home. Which now, by the way, the figuring part of, of the great loss in Italy and Spain was that younger family members, adults, were bringing the virus home to their grandparents who still lived under the same roof. They figure that's part of the problem. At any rate, we know that China is a petri dish for future disasters. We also know, if you're honest, that the Chinese have had agricultural policies in place since the 60s, early 70s, as a consequence of the massive starvation that happened in the Cultural Revolution, encouraging Chinese peasants to, quote, farm wild animals. So you have all these things that you should be eating, bats and frogs and terrapins and all these things that you should just leave alone. But they keep being served up in wet markets where many of them are alive and they get their heads chopped off or they get scalded alive in water, somehow killed and slaughtered right there at the wet market. Of course, the Chinese need to stop this. It's bad enough we can get flus and other viruses from pigs for example, horses, cows, other domestic animals that we live with very closely. Fowl is a great carrier of these things, but we're used to it. We're used to what pigs have, and we're used to these other animals, but we're not used to what these other, quote, wild animals bring from the jungles, and that's what we have to stop. So knowing that China is a petri dish for these sort of disasters, why in the world didn't this administration, it doesn't matter whether it was Democratic or Republican, but the one in the White House now, why didn't say, oh, there's a new round of scourge coming from China, and we actually have commercial interests and contacts there, don't we? Yes, most American manufacturing seems to be done in China these days. Why didn't they begin preparing earlier? If not late December, around Christmas, everyone was distracted. But for God's sakes, why not after the new year? Why didn't some adults in the room say to the administration, how many masks do we have in storage? How many needles and protective clothing sets? That wasn't happening. We have to always live. We human beings now hopefully will get it. We have to always live as if it's not if, but when. The next thing will jump from animal to human. It's a matter of when, not if. Folks, we are speaking with Michael Lewick Troms. He is founder of an organization called Traces. Their website is traces.org. Center for History and Culture is what it's about. His doctorate was in European history from Humboldt University in Berlin. I'm speaking to him right now while he's in Germany, although he's a good Iowa farm boy which increases his street cred, I would think, to have both of those references, a lot of experience in Germany and coming from the heartland of the United States. He is also the force behind the Busseum Tour, a bus that travels around as a museum that brings information to the world. And there's a Busseum Tour that was supposed to start in March of this past year. And it's hopefully going to be coming up before too long, a couple months down the road here. It will be continuing. So you want to go to traces.org, the Traces Spuren website, to find what's happening with the Busseum Tour. Do support traces.org in their work, because if we don't learn the lessons of the past, we'll continue to commit them into the future. And there's a lot of lessons that have been conveyed by the past bus tours and through this one. Now, in talking about number two out of the five foci for your upcoming bus tour, Michael, again, the topic is the killer 1918's flu pandemic. One of the things that I was wondering if there was a parallel from the past to the current that might be very significant. I just saw in news this past 24 hours that there was one of the big churches that chose to have everybody get together and now some 20% of the congregation are testing for COVID-19. That idea that one of the ways that we get together in this country Religion has certainly declined in terms of public participation since 1918. 
but I'm, I'm wondering if that was one of the particular vectors for the disease back in that period. People getting together, you, you mentioned Philadelphia it was the big fundraising for the war that was part of it. Churches or religion as a, a disease vector, does that make sense? Is that part of the historical record? Again, I encourage people to go to our first of the two PowerPoint presentations. Um, this week, part one, we actually have pictures of church services being held outside on the steps of what appears to be maybe a Catholic church because of the architecture. But there are, you know, 100 or 150 people on their knees praying outside this church. We know that court cases were being heard outside. We have pictures of the federal court in San Francisco holding trials outside under the trees where the air would be moving. We also know that, like today, Iowa's own Billy Sunday, who was sort of the Billy Graham of his era, he was sure that the flu pandemic was God punishing America for our wicked ways. My God, we've been wicked for a long time, if that's the case. So yes, churches and I suppose to a lesser extent, synagogue congregations or maybe temples or others often don't help, but they can be transmitters of this virus. What I want to add is, by the way, we have a pandemic now. We had a pandemic 100 years ago. Don't forget, though, that shared, if you will, communicative diseases throughout human history have more been the norm than the ab- abnormality. Pandemics are more unusual, but epidemics were common. If most of your Midwest listeners will do their family research, certainly it's true in my family's case, there were always a great aunt dying of cholera, or there was somebody's neighbor dying of typhoid, or there were always these things coursing through the countryside. Uh, we know there were plagues in colonial New York and Boston and Philadelphia, depending, of course, polluted water in the city, animal-borne diseases, et cetera. So epidemics were common. What's less common are pandemics. That's one thing I want to mention. Another takeaway, though, is, and I don't want to get too metaphysical because I don't know everyone in your audience, but it's, it strikes me the timing of this pandemic there's several different pieces you could you could smash, put together in a new mosaic, and form those sh- shards and put them together, to create a new picture. The BBC was interviewing this seismographer, and it's interesting because we know that with seismic readers, you can detect earthquakes in the earth or shifts of plates or things like this. You can also detect volcanic eruptions. But I did not know that literally with seismographic machines, you can actually detect a long ways away football games and there's a touchdown or you can see the vibrations of rock concerts when someone you know is at the end of a song and the, and the crowd goes wild and so literally the earth is becoming quieter during this period because half of humanity is not driving trucks all day long or having jets take off on runaways or landing so literally the earth is vibrating less now than it was a month ago we also know that our Affluent is decreasing the amount of polluted air, the amount of fossil fuel we're burning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I find it very curious that this virus should erupt now. I don't know what it means. I do look at the Black Death of the medieval period. The Black Death was like a perfect disease for the Middle Ages. It took the worst of their medieval religious extremism, this sort of um, orthodox, officious religious tenor of the times, And the the Black Death fit into that worldview and made things even more dire and more satanic and fateful and hopeless. And the flu pandemic of 1918 came exactly at the end of a horrible world war. It wasn't the first global war. That happened in the 1700s during what we call this French Indian War. Also, the Napoleonic Wars had a global element with battles between the British and the French in North Africa and the Maghreb and other places. So it wasn't the first world war, but it was the first industrialized world war. And you had death on a massive scale. 60 million people died in World War I, 60 million in World War II. But I've always wondered, was it really just a coincidence? I don't mean that someone set the flu virus loose. I don't mean that at all. But, you know, is there something like a collective consciousness Is there something in the human experience that these things take place? I don't know, but I find the timing really curious. The flu of the 1918-1919 variety, within weeks when it was over, if you look in the newspapers at the time, the popular culture, the sheet music, by the summer of 1919, it's like the flu pandemic had not even happened. Every European village has a big memorial to the fall of World War I and World War II, but never a memorial to the flu fallen. It was like, we didn't want to remember this horrible experience. And people couldn't. They didn't know what to do with that size of loss. And now we're having another pandemic. And a few have commented with 
our loved ones dying in the hospitals, we're not allowed to go and hold their hands, which was different in 1918. Most people died at home. But these people who are struggling with these respirators and, you know, they're leaving us alone, except for a few nursing staff, you know, what sort of trauma is that, both for those who are dying and those who survive? That's a good question. Why is this happening now? What's the, quote, convenient mix of of ecological disaster maybe postponed a little bit by our sudden decrease in pollution and consumption. I do not know, but it's curious that these huge medical events often coincide with political events of massive scales, and they totally change history thereafter. The order of the world 1913 was totally different than 1923. In that 10-year period, the death of 16 million people plus the flu victims the world was so racked that the old order couldn't survive. And we wonder now, when we emerge from this, which we will, we just know when or how, the normality that we had won't return. I keep hearing people in emails or on, in the web saying, oh, well, when things get back to normal, they don't realize things will never be the way they were. And maybe they shouldn't be, but they will not be. They can't be because something's changed us. Well, I'd love to keep you on longer, Michael. Right now, I'd like you to recap for our listeners one more time about the Busseum tour that will be upcoming and that people have to check out for the late-breaking news via traces.org. Tell us again the five major components of the Busseum display that are, will be going around sometime this year. Our exhibit in our newest bus is called Hidden or Forbidden No More prequels to the greatest generation. And there are five sub foci that we have. Those would be Kikin the Kaiser, anti-German state in World War I. The second is the killer, the 1918 flu pandemic. The third is whiskey cookers, depression era farmer bootleggers. The fourth is America's white cancer, the KKK of the 1920s, the so-called second wave. And the fifth is the cow wars, farmer rebellions in the 1930s. These topics all dovetail to paint a bigger picture, which is the social landscape that the greatest generation grew up in. This is basically the era 1914 and 1939. What were the national moments or the social movements that impacted those who later got out of those platoons and fought their way up the cliffs of Omaha Beach? What did they grow up on? They grew up on depression, um, also racism, uh, sexism, poverty, hunger, want. And so we look at that. That exhibit is available from now until the election and then again next spring. If this interview has interested you and you want to see about sponsoring the bus in your community when we're near you, you can contact Christine at staff at traces.org. That's staff like personnel, S-T-A-F-F at traces.org. And if you cannot come to our bus or you can't wait for us to, to reach you, go to our website, www traces.org. And there you can click on historical case studies. And all of our PowerPoint uh, films are there. Plus, our exhibit is visible on that website as well. The, The text is there. Even our catalog from the exhibit is downloadable in PDF form. And you can find it at amazon.com. There you'll find most of our 15 books that we've published over the last 20 years about these stories. So there's lots of resources. Again, traces.org. We've been speaking with Michael Lewick Troms, who is founder of Traces Center for History and Culture, located right in the heartland, Iowa, in the United States. Michael, thank you again for doing this work. I really do think it's so important until people see truth, until people open their eyes to the facts. And that does mean getting rid of a lot of fake news. And even though I do not agree with President Trump about what is fake news and what is not, he doesn't seem to trouble himself too much about facts. I find that facts and truth and moving towards truth is so absolutely important to creating a better world. And I thank you for being part of that force. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Again, go to traces.org. Thanks to Andrew Jansen for production assistance on today's program. We'll see you all next week for Spirit in Action. The theme music for this program is Turning of the World, performed by Sarah Thompson. Check out all things Spirit in Action on northernspiritradio.org. 
guests, links, stations, and a place for your feedback, suggestions, and support. Thanks for listening. I'm Mark Helpsmeet, and I hope you find deep roots to support you to grow steadily toward the light. This is Spirit in Action. <music>